Hello everybody, it's Stephen here for the Idiot Quilter and welcome to my weekly Idiot Quilter episode and this is episode 109 for April the 6th, 2021. So let's get right in. I'm going to talk about what my backdrop is in a few minutes and explain that. No, it is not a quilt, it's a panel but we'll come back to that in a moment. But right now I want to show you something that I just finished up and I made these. These are in the hoop applique little bowls. You make them in pieces and then put the pieces together. And um, you know how much I like doing in the hoop applique. Well, these were a lot of fun to make. They took a while, but I think they're really, really pretty. And there you can see the inside of this one. Now you will notice there's a difference between the inside of that one and the inside of this one. That's because I made a mistake on this one. Should have read my instructions a little bit more carefully. But by the time I got halfway through creating these petals, if you wish, that make up the side of the bowl, um, I then realized probably there should have been a backing fabric in there as well. And then you wouldn't see all the stitching coming through. Although it doesn't look all that bad. And if you had something in it, you wouldn't really notice that. But you can see the difference between the inside of this one and the inside of the one that was done correctly. Now you might wonder about the fabric I used why it's very very colorful of course it is uh kaif facet fabric i love kaif facets fabrics although i have mentioned before that i'm hoping he will come out with a whole new line of fabric very soon and maybe lean a little away from the floral patterns although that seems to be his signature design and i do love them and i always have some of his fabrics on hand and so i had some of it on hand and that's why I create these two bowls from. Now I'm thinking the other day when I got finished this and looking at it this would look really good I think as a uh, made out of Christmas fabric and fill it with some you know Christmas balls or something like that as a table centerpiece. You could put a candle like a an electric candle not a real candle. Um, do people use real candles anymore? You know I don't know. I, I won't touch them because, you know, I don't want to set my house on fire. Um, but anyways, a, a candle in here in the center of it and some, you know, garland or something around it as well. I think that could look really nice. And, and you could do something similar uh, with this as it is right now, too. Also, they'd make really nice uh, little roll or bread baskets as well on your table. Um, so these are very versatile. I think you could do a lot of things with them. Okay, so what else have I been working on? Well, you know that I bought, time for coffee. You know that I bought uh, the book by uh, Brickman, who has done, um, or Brickman, Brickman, Brickman. You know, the book that has over 5,000 uh, curated blocks from history, basically. And I bought the companion uh, block base they call it um, electric quilt program which you don't have to have electric quilt 8 to use it but it will work with electric quilt 8 and you know more bang for your buck I suppose but um, anyways electric quilt who distributes it they have set up a sort of a sew along or a block of the month uh, where we're using the uh, blocks from the book and that are also in the program uh, to get used to how to use the program and to create sort of a sampler quilt. So I have done the first block. And you want to know something? Um, I enjoyed doing this once I figured it out. And I pulled an idiot quilter move and I will show you that in a moment. But this is the first block. And it's a little unusual. I've never really seen that block before, but I kind of liked it. The thing with doing this so along they show you how to create the blocks, how to pull them up and print out the uh, cutting instructions using uh, Block Base Plus, uh, the electric quilt program. However, they didn't really show you how to sew the blocks together. And I was trying to figure this out from the diagram. Now this is where I pulled an idiot quilter move. The first one I did, it said you had to cut these uh, squares and into triangles and things and then assemble it okay and you were doing it in quadrants okay so this is basically a four patch and each one's the same you're just turning it about 45 degrees um to get this pattern okay fine i'm looking at it and it should have dawned on me 
that don't sew triangles together, make half square triangles. You see, that's the one lacking thing in electric quilt. They don't, it doesn't come with instructions that tell you how to assemble the blocks. I guess they just assume you will figure it out. Well, the first one I assembled, and I don't think I kept it, no, I tossed it, was a mess because I was sewing triangles together to get these pieces here. But if you look at it really up close, let's turn it this way so you see this one. What do you see? Half square triangle, half square triangle, block. This piece is a triangle, this piece is a triangle, but those are okay. So when I was sewing these together, they weren't going together very well. It was a mess until it, re it dawned on me, those are half square triangles. Now you might say, well, yeah, that's pretty obvious. Yeah, well, I'm an idiot. Um, no, when I was looking at it on the instruction page, do I have that here so I can show you? Yeah, here it is. Uh, glare. You see, there it is. And there's the uh, outline. Uh, glare. See, this is the outline. And just looking at that outline, it looked like you had to cut triangles. It, they looked like they were irregular. It didn't look like half square triangles, at least not in my head. They looked like rectangles. But yeah, because I was looking at one of the little, little triangles, it's a little triangle that goes up here in this corner. So when I looked at it, it looks like these were rectangles and it looked like they were sort of on the biased or whatever. And that's what threw me off. If I'd only looked over and realized, yeah, that's a half square triangle, that's a half square triangle, that's a triangle, that's a triangle, that's a triangle. No problem. Once I figured that out, it went together, no problem. Now, this, I learned a lesson here. One needs to study the instructions, the pattern instructions first, before you start doing anything. Read them carefully, think about them. I just leapt right in and that's where I made the mistake. But I have solved the mistake and it's coming along nicely and I think the next one comes out on April the 9th. And I'm not sure how many there's going to be from this. Um, but apparently afterwards you can put them all together and you've got a, a small sampler quilt. So I think it's a good way to learn the program. And uh, it's almost like a mystery quilt because they're not telling us in advance what the blocks are that we're going to be using. And it may introduce me to some blocks that aren't so common, I'm hoping, um, that will you know add to my repertoire when I design my own quilts sort of thing. So I'm really glad I invested in the book and in the software. All right, what else am I working on? Okay, I should <laughs> be quilting the quilt I showed you last week, the Carpenter's Wheel quilt. Um, and I will be quilting that, but uh, I'm, I'm going to try and get at it like tomorrow, get it all layered out and then spend the rest of the week quilting it. But in the meantime, um, what I've been working on is I decided that my dining room table needs a new table runner, something springy. The one that's on it right now, I have several I've designed for that table. I've got one for the fall. Uh, I've got one sort of for Christmas. And I have one that sits on it most of the year round, which is sort of in blacks and grays. My tablecloth is white that's on it. Um, and it looks very, very elegant. And it was a uh, in the hoop applique design as well. And it took me quite a long time to make it. It's sort of in the Dresden style. And I love it. I think it's great. Um, but I think need something right now. We've moved into spring, need something a little bit more, um, you know, springy, you know, cheerful kind of thing. I was almost gonna say the word gay, but no, I'm not. Um, but you know what I mean. So I just happened to see uh, one of the very latest videos uh, on YouTube from Do uh, Jordan Fabrics. Donna Jordan had this one that she designed and anything she designs, she provides a free pattern for it. And I saw this. Now at first glance, it didn't catch my eye because I don't like the colors in it. They're not my color scheme. But when I watched her tutorial on putting this together and she was using some other fabrics for it, 
I kind of thought, yeah, that would look kind of cool. I'll just do it in other fabrics. And so I decided to do it in butterfly fabrics. Because you know, I've been collecting butterfly fabrics and they're just sitting around doing nothing. So that's why I'm going to do it. This is what the block is going to look like. I've made uh, three of these now. Three, one, two, three. Um, very colorful, very butterfly -y. And um, yeah, I, I might have on hindsight, but I'm going to go ahead with it anyways. I might have used a little bit of a lighter block for the pinwheel that's in the center. So it would stand out a little bit more. Um, I didn't think of that when I was picking out these fabrics because I was just so excited that I wanted to use these butterfly fabrics. And, you know, I think it'll be fine when it's done. But yeah, on hindsight, should have used something a little lighter, I think, in there to make it more pronounced because that's what she's done. Or at least she picked colors. She had different colors in each one, but her colors do make the pinwheel part of it stand out a little bit more. But nevertheless, I'm carrying on with it kind of have to because I've cut all the pieces already. Now there is something, okay? And I know I should do this. This is another idiot move. When you're not sure what the block's going to look at, don't cut all your pieces. Just cut enough for that block, make the block, and then determine whether or not you want to use that color scheme. Yeah, should have done that. Didn't do it. But I'm not unhappy with this. This will be fine. And then there's some sashing that goes into it and the borders and things like that. And so it will be fine. It's just a table runner, something to spruce up my dining room, which is kind of funny because I am not one of those people who does seasonal decor in their house, you know? Um, although since I started quilting and sewing, I'm becoming more that person now. So anyways, that I am working on and I will show you the end result of that. I, I'm hoping I'll get that done before the next Idiot Quilter episode, but we'll see. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to quilt a quilt and do that too as well. Yeah. Um, so, what else am I doing? All right. This I'm sure you know about, but um, and it's not really new to me, but I decided I would give it a try. And that's taking your scrap fabrics and making two and a half inch strips out of them and the way I am doing this is I'm using adding machine old adding machine rolls of paper and you just sew these um, you know you, you're just you cut a strip sew it across fold it over so you've got a quarter inch seam up between your two pieces then you do another one etc it's like paper piecing that kind of thing except you're just making strips of random fabric and it doesn't matter what the sizes are and the whole that's the back front and then you've got these for whatever and it's just a good way to use up your stash it's also a good way when you aren't feeling like um, doing something more involved or serious when you just you know you, sometimes you get that mood where you just want to sew but you don't want to think about it I call it mindless sewing um, so I'll work on these over time. I have no idea what I'll use them for, but I'm sure they'll come into handy for something. You could use them for binding. You could use them for borders. Um, you know, you're making a scrappy quilt. These would be fine. You could put the, the strips, if you've got enough of them together to make a whole quilt. It would be, you know, just something fun. Um, now, one thing I discovered though is I wanted these strips to be two and a half inches wide, right? When I bought this, I thought that's what I got. No, this is not quite two and a half inches wide. I think it works out to two and a quarter inches wide. Now, I could, when I trim these down, uh, when you cut off the paper on the edges and stuff, I could have left it at two and a quarter, but I thought, you know, hmm, I'm kind of geometrically and mathematically challenged when it comes to putting quilts together. So if I have two and a quarter inch and something calls for two and a half inch, it's going to throw me for a loop. So easy to solve. There was a strips of fabric are hanging over the edges of this. I took the one edge of my fabric as my straight edge and that's where I use that to cut all the pieces that were overhanging. And then I just marked it from the other side, put on the straight edge of what I had just cut, 
that's where I put the zero mark of my ruler, go over two and a half inches so it's off the paper, but it's on the fabric because I leave enough overhang and just trim it down, it becomes two and a half, and then I pull the paper off and away you go. So, yeah. Um, this is an ongoing project, as I said. It's just something when I need some mindless sewing, maybe pull it out and do a few, um, you know, for 15 minutes or something like that, away you go. But from now on, when I have scraps left over from a quilt that I'm making, I have my little scrap bucket, which is my gigantic thimble that I 3D printed. I throw them in here. And then after I'm finished that project, I'll go through the scraps. I'll cut them down into various widths of, strip, of strips um, that I can get out of it. I have a basket back there. I throw them in that. It's got my papers. Bang, away you go. Okay, so let's talk now with more coffee. Let's talk about what's behind me. That is the panel. Well, it's really not a panel because it's a continuous piece of fabric uh, for the City Lights uh, by Northcott fabric line. And you know, that's the one where I've been trying to get the fabrics to make this up here. Well, guess what? I got all the fabrics. And I hung this up behind me so you could see what I'm talking about. They're the ones that they're going to cut into strips or that I'm going to cut into strips to do, get the shadow off, or the glare off, to do these in here. Now I did find, I think I mentioned this last week, I did find fabrics in my stash that could fill in for the ones that I could not get at Ultimate Sewing. And I had that already laid out. Well, guess what? I got a call from Ultimate Sewing last week and said my fabric was in. For city lights and that was fast so i went in and got the rest of the fabrics for it so just to show you those are the that's the panel that you need that's the focal fab focus fabric then each one of those little rectangles in the pattern need a shadow this is the official fabric for the pattern for that it is a black but it has sort of a a very light i don't know if you can see it or not. You see it's got a little light gray sort of patterning into the background of it. You don't need very much of that. And then for the um, background, this. And for the backing, I had a backing but it wasn't the same line. I have this. And for the binding, I've got a lot of this. I have this. So I did buy extra fabric because I always do because I do like the line. So all of these together along with that big cityscape uh, fabric is going to make that uh, quilt. It's actually not really a quilt. It's more of a wall hanging because I think the size is, well, it's not a bad size. It's 52 and a half inches by 40. So that's a little bigger than a wall hanging, unless you got a big wall. But anyways, that's the next project online here. Uh, once I get the uh, carpenter's wheel quilted. Okay, so I also bought a new tool. Now I have not used this tool yet and I do intend, if I can find it, where'd I put it? Oh, it's right here in front of me, okay. I do intend to do a tutorial on this or a demo on this tool. Now this tool has been a while, around for a while. It's by Susan K. Cleveland and it's called the Prairie Pointer. It says create prairie points quickly and easily. But I didn't get it for prairie points. What I got it for was for doing Dresdens. Because I was listening to a podcast, I think it was Quilt and Tell or something like that, and they were talking about this tool and how great it was when you're making Dresdens. And I have a pattern for Dresdens. I've shown it to you. It's one of the ones that's on my vision wall uh, for a future project that I want to do. So I went on Amazon. They had it. I purchased it. It was about 30 bucks, not cheap. But the thing is, and I haven't tried it yet, but I've been reading about it. This is metal, not plastic. And the point is, you iron on it. If you take a look, I guess you find your measurements for your point, put your fabric on it, and then you press it. And that holds your point. And that sounds like a good idea. 
So that's why I bought it. Do I need another tool? No, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> I collect them. So anyways, it does have detailed instructions inside, it says. And as I said, I haven't even opened it yet. Um, but I think this will be very handy. I mean, do you need something like this to make Dresdens? No, you don't. But I've really never done Dresdens before. I have experimented with Dresdens uh, when I thought about doing that pattern. I wanted to see how difficult they would be to make. They're not hard to make, but I think this just makes things a little bit easier and a little bit more accurate when you're folding the fabric to get, you know, everybody the same size point. So that was a purchase I made this week. Now, normally the next section would be Wally sews. Well, he has been sewing and I forgot to take video. Uh, it wasn't anything too exciting. He's still working on his jacket. Um, had a little problem with that, uh, as you know, but he's got those problems solved and whatnot, and it's come along really quite nicely. I guess somebody in his sewing group wants to make a jean jacket. Walter's not impressed. Well, you know, jean jackets, come on. Hello, the 80s called. They want their jean jacket, their jean material back. Um, who wears jean jackets anymore? But now he's thinking, so he's saying he's not going to take that class, but then he got thinking about it and he's thinking, mm, maybe he could take that class. He just won't make it as a jean jacket. He won't use jean fabric. He'll use something else. And that's probably a good idea because I'm sure he'll learn some more things uh, about making jackets. And um, yeah, you can pick any kind of material you want for that kind of thing. You don't have to make it out of jean fabric. So I'll leave it to Walter to figure that out. And he probably will. Not probably, he will. Okay, so I want today to talk a little bit about embroidery threads. This is what my demo is this week, and I want to talk about what I use and what I have the best luck with. Now, this is for machine embroidery, and um, I just realized I don't have my threads laid out here, so I will have to pause the video. Uh, it'll only be one second for you while I gather all my sources together. So I'll be right back. Don't you go away. Okay, so I have my embroidery threads assembled in front of me. Now, right off the bat, I'm going to tell you the one that I use the most is Floriani. Now, why do I use Floriani? Well, one, Floriani is really great quality in um, threads. Here's some Floriani in green. They come on spools of, these I think are 1500 meters, I believe. It's either 1000 or 1500 There's a lot. Price-wise, they're not bad. Embroidery thread always costs you more money than regular thread, of course. Hiccups. I think I pay about $6.99 at Ultimate Sewing for a spool of this. Um, but the reason I have Floriani is what this is what I started with because this was recommended by Ultimate Sewing when I first bought my first embroidery machine. And it's been great. I have had absolutely no problems with this thread. It's strong. It is a polyester. Um, and that bothers some people think you shouldn't use polyester on with cotton. Um, yeah, that might have been true 20 years ago or whatever, but polyester today is um, totally different from the polyester that was created 20 years ago. So there's no problem with that. Um, the colors are really, really nice. And that's why I use Floriani because I probably have 400 spools of Floriani in various colors. Um, so that's the one I am partial to. However, I have experimented with some others. Madeira is another one. Janome actually uh, is a distributor of Madeira threads, although I haven't seen much of a selection in them. They seem to um, have little eight spool sets that are pri quite pricey and the spools are very s small. I'm not sure how many meters are on those. Um, they're nice colors. Madeira is a good name in embroidery threads. But I went on Monfil and you've heard me talk about Monfil.ca. It's a company in Quebec and I buy my stabilizers and I have bought embroidery threads from them and sewing thread. I love their sewing thread. Um, but they do sell Madeira. 
as well in these large cones. And I think one of these cones has, this is 5,000 meters on one of these cones. Now I only bought about eight colors of this, basically your standard colors to try it. Uh, I am very impressed with it. It's very nice. The only thing about Madeira that is different I find from Floriani, they're both Floriani, they're both uh, quality products. Um, you can get Madeira in smaller cones, but I mean, this is like, I think they charge $12.99 or $11.99 for this amount. And I'm paying $6.99 for Floriani. Yeah. Um, but as I said, I've got a lot of Floriani, so I'm sticking with it. But Floriani also has a little bit more of a shine, slightly more, I think, than the Madeira. And I like the shine. But both, very, very good. Um, and you want a good quality uh, embroidery thread in your machine. Because otherwise, you're going to be constantly rethreading your machine because your thread's going to keep breaking all the time. And you know, the cheaper embroidery threads might have a lot of fuzz on them and that gunks up your bobbin, gunks up your needle, all kinds of problems. If you're going to spend the time, and machine embroidery takes time, as you know, if you're going to spend that time, then spend a little bit more on your embroidery threads. That's the way I look at it anyways. Now, they, uh, Monfil also carries their own brand of embroidery threads in 5,000 meter and in... Um, 1,000 meter spools. Here's two of them. And theirs is excellent. Walter uses their uh, brand. It's called Superb or Super B. Never sure how you're supposed to say it. It's spelt like Superb, but it's got a capital B at the end of it. So does that mean you're supposed to say it as Super B? I don't know. But either way, good quality thread. It works just as well as the Floriani or the Madeira. It has a little bit of a shine to it. This is a white this one's got some of the paper, or the cellophane still on it, but um, the price is really good on these. I forget what I paid, but they're both still a little less expensive than what I'm paying for Floriani. Um, and I've had good luck with them too. Now, Walter, as I said, uses their thread, Monfil's uh, Superb or Super B thread, uh, embroidered thread, all the time. He loves it, um, and he has not had any problems with it whatsoever. So these three brands, um, Superb, Madeira, and Floriani, are all excellent products. Now, Walter ha does think, from his investigations, that in the States, Monfil sells Superb in the States, but it's under a different name. And I think it might be, and don't quote me on this, and when Walter sees this, he'll probably say I'm wrong, and if I'm wrong, I'll tell you later. I think it's called Exquisite. I think. And that's an embroidery thread that if you're familiar with Dime Designs in Machine Embroidery Company, that's one that they seem to sell a lot of as well. So all are good quality embroidery threads. Now you can go online and you can go onto Amazon and you can pick up embroidery threads and you can pick them up for ridiculously lower prices than what I'm paying for these. Not worth it. How do I know that? I picked up something. Now, I don't know if it's manufactured by actually the Brother Company, but it was called Brother Embroidery Thread. But it may be a different company. It comes out of China. Well, that doesn't mean something's not good because it comes out of China anymore because everything comes from China these days, right? Um, I bought some of that for Walter uh, at Christmas time, I think. Um, when he first got his embroidery machine, or maybe I bought it for him for whatever occasion to try. He does not really like it. Um, I think you get a lot of thread breaks with it. Um, it was less expensive than these ones, but it wasn't that much cheaper. But he stays away from it. So just beware. Um, stick with brand names you've heard of. Madeira, Floriani, Superb, Exquisite, I don't think you can go wrong with any of those. But my favorite, as I've already said, because I have so much of it, is Floriani. Okay, so that's the end of that little demo for this week. It wasn't really a demo. It was more of a, you know, show and share. So that takes us to subscribers quilt of the week. Now, 
I have two little videos I'm going to insert here. The first one is uh, the uh, from Yvonne McNeil. Yvonne McNeil was my featured subscriber quilter uh, last week and she showed uh, her sampler quilt which was not quite finished yet. It was up on her design wall. Well she has finished it and she sent me a picture of that. So I'm going to put that uh, in here right now and right after it I'm going to show you this week's uh, featured subscriber quilter and that's Wendy and I'm sorry Wendy if I say your name wrong. Kingen or Kingen I'm not sure which K-I-N-G-E-N -E but she has sent us some samples of her work as well. So I'm going to put those in this in this spot right now for you. This has just been sent to me by Yvonne this week. This is her finished quilt, which I featured uh, last week in the subscriber quilts. So I thought maybe you'd be interested in seeing what the final version looked like with all the sashings. And it looks quite nice. The sashing and the cornerstones really make it stand out. Good job, Yvonne. This week's quilt has been submitted by Wendy Kidjin. Kin Jin. I'm not sure if I'm saying Wendy's last name correctly, so I'm sorry about that. Um, but she has sent us a very lovely quilt with several pictures showing it up close. The first picture shows us the overall quilt and she's done it in sort of a red and green um, fabric and there's some very lovely quilting on it and she's given us some uh, close-ups of the quilting which definitely looks like it is free motion very brave Wendy um, I could not do free motion quilting quite in that much detail and uh, her backing fabric is a Merry Christmas fabric so although the front of this has Christmas colors um, the back fabric she has chosen definitely says it is a Christmas quilt um, it looks very nice. She has it spread out here on a couch for us to see. And the pattern is by Debbie Caffrey and it's called Mountains and Valleys. So of course you could do this quilt in any fabric you chose to do it in. Um, so overall, I think it's a very beautiful quilt. The quilting on it is very detailed, very lovely, and picks up the flower motif uh, in the various blocks that are in the quilt. So thank you, Wendy, for sending us this very, very nice quilt. So if you'd like to send me pictures of your textile fab fiber art, that's what I'm calling quilting, sewing, garments, whatever, even knitting, crocheting fits into that category, uh, You'll find my email address in the uh, show notes below and uh, feel free to send those to me and I will feature you in an episode coming up soon. So what else is in there? Okay, you will find uh, the link to Craft and Chat because guess what? Tomorrow, this is Tuesday, tomorrow is Wednesday and tomorrow is the first Wednesday of the month and that's when we have Craft and Chat. If you don't know what Craft and Chat is, it's simply uh, three hours of getting together on Zoom with other people to work on whatever we're working on. It does not have to be quilting and sewing specific, although many of the people who are regulars on there, that is what they're working on, but it doesn't matter. Anything you're working on, we have a couple of people that are paper crafters and they work on their uh, projects during this time as well. So anything, it's informal. It's like a drop-in. You don't have to pre-register for it. If it starts at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the link is in the show notes. That's the Zoom link. Uh, you come in, I admit you, and away we go. Um, we just talk informally. I may ask people, you know, what are you working on? Just to break the ice at the beginning. And who knows, we end up talking as we're working on our projects about almost anything. The one thing though, that we don't talk about is we don't talk about COVID and it's drama free, meaning it's pleasant, constructive uh, conversation. It isn't a bitch session. Okay. So it's there just to relax you, maybe get caught up on something you've been working on. Um, it's just, I find it lots of fun. I find it inspiring. I find it relaxing. And so this is why I do it. Um, if you can't be there for right at one o'clock, but you're still going to join in a little bit later on, that's fine. Yeah, um, there is no restrictions here whatsoever. If you're a little bit late, doesn't matter. Um, if you can't stay for the full time, it doesn't matter. It's up to you. 
it's all up to you. Uh, very informal. I don't record it or anything like that. So uh, links, as I have said, are in the show notes below. So I hope, and we've had a few new people each month that we do it, and that's really nice. We're still a small group. Um, you know, there's really only about, I don't know, 10 of us maybe or so uh, in there, but it's growing all the time. And uh, so please join us if you can. Yes, I know some of you are working still and you can't join us during the day and I'm sorry about that. Um, but that's just the way it works out. Um, and having said that, and I mentioned this on my vlog yesterday, I am thinking down the road of having uh, something like this, but for a little longer, possibly on a Saturday. Um, it would be the same format and it would be for a little longer, maybe six hours or something like that, maybe from 10 in the morning to four in the afternoon, something on that line. Again, very informal, kind of a drop-in uh, thing. Um, but putting it on a Saturday means that those people that work during the week and want to get involved in this, they would be able to. But I haven't set up a date for that yet. And it probably, at the earliest, it would probably be in May sometime. Okay, but you know, watch this space for more information about that. Okay, and also there is the latest episode to So Chatty, episode two. In episode two, we discussed um, Walter's sewing machine, which is his 67, his Janome 6700P. And we looked at all the features of that machine and we talked about cleaning and maintaining it and some other related uh, discussion bits about that machine. So if you're interested in that, you might want to check out that video. Also, um, we have uh, the next episode of So Chatty is going to be later this week, hopefully. And in that one, we're going to feature my main machine, which is the Continental M7 by Janome. So hope you can tune in for that. And we are compiling questions uh, that are related to sewing machines and sewing in general. Uh, on that channel. You, if you have a question that you think we might be able to help you out with, you can write it in the comment section and we will take a look at it and get back to you. Or what I might do is I may save them all up and do one episode where I handle everybody's questions at once. Now, we don't have the answers to everything and we won't BS you. So if you might ask us something, we'll go, yeah, never thought of it, don't know. We will research an answer for you to a certain degree. If we've got time for it and, you know, that kind of thing, uh, then we'll do that. But, you know, ask away. Okay, and there is a link to Ultimate Sewing. And there's a link to this week's uh, YouTube channel, which is by Pat Sloan. And I'm going to talk about that right now. Pat Sloan, you probably are familiar with her. She's one of the, what I call a guru in the quilting world. And she has a YouTube channel and I believe she has a, a website as well. Um, and she's constantly doing projects and things. Uh, she does sew alongs. She's got tips and tricks and techniques. She uh, talks about patterns. She talks about color choice. Basically, she talks about everything that has to do with quilting. I find her very interesting. I find her very informative. Uh, she can be a little scattered here and there, but then, you know, that happens to the best of us, right? I should talk. Um, but they're very, very informative. So if you have never heard of Pat Sloan, and I'm not sure why you wouldn't have, but it's a possibility, then you'll probably want to check out her YouTube channel. And I've put, the sh as I've said, the link to it's in the show notes. Okay, so that takes us to what's on my vision board for future projects. This is one, I'm not so sure if I'm actually going to do it or not, but it's there because it is a classic block design. And you've probably heard of it before. It's called the Bird of Paradise design. And I have a pattern that came from the, uh, I believe it came from Block Magazine, which is by Missouri Star Quilt Company, which I've, you've heard me talk about before and I love it. It's a great magazine. Um, I get it in digital format so I can read it on my iPad. And if I see a pattern I like, I print it out. And this is one. Now I do not like the colors that are here, but you can see the block, the, the little, they call that a bird of paradise. It's a little bit unusual, but it's also I think what's considered a classic block. So 
I am going to make that one, but I have decided I'm going to make it using charm packs because actually I do believe the pattern says you can do it in charm packs. Um, the quilt size when you get it finished is 75 by 91. I have a picture of it down here. Again, I hate the colors. Well, first of all, I'm not a fan of pink. So that's why immediately I get turned off. Um, the block size unfinished is 16 and a half inches, finished at 16 inches. So big blocks on this. Um, and yeah, um, it doesn't tell you, say here that you can use charm packs, but you are cutting things down, I believe, into five inch squares. And it looks like you've got to use a Drunkard's Path ruler with it as well. Yeah, they're showing that up here in the yellow. So, yeah, I'm really thinking now, why did I say I was going to use Charm Pack with this? Oh, well, <laughs> I'll figure that out at some point in time. But right now, I think I can use a Charm Pack for creating the pieces of it. And this is the Charm Packs that I've picked. I have two of these and uh, this is by Northcott and it's called Sandcastle Chips. And I thought these would be kind of interesting. They're in purples and teals and blues, which you know I like. So right now, that's what I'm thinking I'm going to be using for this quilt. Um, that could change, who knows. And when will I get to this? No idea. And you know, quite to be quite frank about it, now that I'm looking at it again, it's really not making me really excited. I really have to do this right now. But it's the block that kind of interests me. So we'll see. That's down the road. It was on my vision board and it may sit on my vision board for a long time. Okay, so that takes me to the quilt I'm going to critique this week. Now, this one's not really a quilt, it's a wall hanging, but it was my first attempt at basically paper piecing. And this was a very complicated paper piecing project as you're going to see. Now, it is a landscape and it's supposed to be a mountain with a sun or a moon up in the top of it. Um, but when I picked my fabrics, as you'll see, I picked some really kind of wild fabrics for it. So you can still see the landscape, but I call it alien landscape. And you'll understand when you see the quilt and you hear my critique of it. So here we go. The quilt that I'm critiquing this week that's one of my own is called Alien Landscape. And I think it's pretty obvious that's why I called it Alien Landscape. Uh, this is a paper piecing pattern and I had never done a paper piecing pattern before in my life and I took this as a class and I took the class because I wanted to learn how to do something like this. I'm not going to uh, kid you this was a pretty complicated quilt. Um, organizing the pieces the fabrics for each of the spots on it was a bit of a chore and it was very easy to get confused. Now one reason I call it Alien Landscape is because of the colors that I chose for this. Uh, if this had been done in other more natural colors, you know, forest colors, that kind of thing, landscape colors, it would definitely look more like a landscape with a, a mountain and a valley and the moon or the sun in the, over top. But I decided to be unconventional and pick these, uh, mostly batiks, to do this quilt in. Now, it is a quilt that I'm very proud of and it hangs on a wall in my rec room. Um, not the best of lighting right when I took this picture, but it does give you an example of what I have done. Um, I did have some problems with it, but overall, because it was paper piecing, the pieces did go together very well. I think there were over 80 pieces in this particular quilt. Um, and I did learn a lot. Uh, the quilting on it, which you probably can't see very well, but I'll try to blow it up a little bit, um, is just basically my standard wavy line walking foot quilting 
uh, or no not actually it's not I did try some different things in different parts of it um, and actually for the most part I'm very proud of how this turned out it does look better in real life than in this picture so it's something a little different it's definitely one of those kind of pieces that when people come over to my house and they see it they kind of go wow what's that I'm taking that as a compliment when they say what's that not as in oh my god what's that so yeah um would I do another one mm, not so sure about that um for a couple of reasons uh one I found it a bit tedious and where am I going to put it um I only have so much wall space I suppose you can swap them out but anyways that's my critique of one of my first attempt at paper piecing so of course I break all the rules when it comes to doing things I do that all the time I mean if there were quilt police I'd be in prison for life but I kind of like it it hangs on my wall um, as you could see because that's where I was showing it from and um, would I do another one mm, not really sure uh, it that was pretty involved in, in, in making that but I'm glad I did it because I learned a lot okay so that takes us to online fabric stores and this week I am featuring one that's in my neck of the woods called the quilters bolt now I have been to their physical store it's in a little town called Millbrook Millbrook Ontario that's about mm, 45 minutes 50 minutes drive maybe an hour from us it's a quaint little town and they have two quilt stores there actually well this one was one of them but it doesn't exist anymore except online um, before we got into COVID and the whole bit she was struggling I think a little bit she's um, a young person well young she's probably in her 30s I don't know whatever so that's young to me and you know she's uh, got a family to raise and I think she was just finding the store a little bit too much but she's maintained an online presence uh, as well I did like her store though it was really really nice and uh, yeah but anyways that's the way things go these days right so it's called the quilters bolt and as I said it's in Millbrook Ontario and I checked out their fabric prices their fabric prices are about 19 dollars a meter and up so they're a little on the higher end for price but they have a fairly good collection and they do have pre-cuts as well and the reason I bring up the pre-cuts is I like pre-cuts I especially love jelly rolls and um, charm packs and online a lot of these stores don't have that many to choose from well she does have a, not a bad selection um, maybe not as full as I would like it to be but that's just me and I, I get it you know um, these charm packs and things come and they go because they're usually based around a particular designer or fabric line and you know what might be in this week is out next week so you know it's a juggling match to decide how much you're going to keep in stock I get that from a business point of view but she does have a selection of those um, does she sell sewing machines no nope, she does not sell sewing machines um, does she have some notions on there yes and she has a, f a good variety of notions and the prices are pretty much what you would expect they're in the ballpark here um, she does sell patterns as well um, and I think she had a, a fairly good selection of patterns too um, I didn't check though to see if she physically mails the patterns to you or if they're downloadable um, I should have checked that out um, I prefer downloadable patterns uh, especially right now given everything we're going through um, but it's just it's immediate gratification I buy the fabric fabric <laughs> pattern that's what I mean I buy the pattern I can download it immediately I don't have to wait for it to come by snail mail um, her thread she deals primarily in glide which is a really good thread uh, for quilting I know that at my local long, long arm shop that's what she uses a lot of but she also has a brand of thread I've never heard of before called Cairo C-A-I-R-O Cairo um, now a lot of her threads at the time that I took a look at this 
for this video she was out of stock of but I imagine she's getting more um, I'm curious about the Cairo threads I should take a look and maybe order some from her because I don't know anything about them I don't know where they originate from I know nothing about them because I've never heard of that so that's something worth uh, researching a little bit more maybe some of you have used those threads and maybe they're by another a, a major manufacturer and this is just what they call it but like I said I need to do some more research about that and maybe I make a little note to myself to actually do that research Cairo okay yeah see what I find out about that if I find out anything interesting I'll share it with you on another episode um but as I said a lot of her threads seem to be out of stock right now um she does have some kits she also has remnants and bolt ends which she sells at um sorry walter's up that's the shower um she does have like i said remnants and bolt ends uh which is kind of nice because she sells those at a reduced price to get rid of them and there's nothing wrong with remnants or bolt ends um and you can also pre-order uh new fabrics i am not sure what the procedure for that is it wasn't it didn't look like it was very clear on her uh, online store uh, probably you need to send her if you see something that you know is coming out um, you can probably send her an email and say hi I'm interested in this um, how do I go about pre-ordering it I don't know if she needs a deposit I imagine she does um, but anyways that's something you know you can explore uh, shipping okay she has free shipping in Canada if your order is over $200 um, but it's only in Canada but otherwise her if it's under $200 it looks like she has a flat rate of $14 Canadian that I think is pretty good um, US and international it looks like you have to email them to find out what she charges for that um, and as I said she doesn't have a physical store so it's worth looking at I've put the link to the quilters bolt in the show notes so you can check it out especially if you live here in Ontario in southern Ontario it's just too bad she doesn't have the physical store anymore because that was a nice little store okay so that takes us almost to the end of today's episode um just want to talk for a minute about um well I've already talked about the latest episode of so chatty we are enjoying doing that channel it is a little bit different from this one and from my vlog and Stephen and Walter live because it's a little bit we're a little bit more serious well I'm kind of serious on most of my vlogs but um but we are really trying to help out people who are making a first-time purchase or a new to the sewing world or first time purchase of a sewing machine and we're doing it from our personal experiences because we have nothing to gain by embellishing what we tell you because we're not selling these machines we don't get any kickback from these machines so it, you can trust us it is our honest review we try to be as accurate as we possibly can but there may be sometimes when we say something that you won't agree with and that's fine you can put it in the show notes and we'll explore it further it's a learning process for us as well and of course craft and chat as I've already talked about coming up tomorrow Wednesday April the 7th starting at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time hope to see many of you there for those of you that can make it okay so that's it for me for this week so tune in next week to see what we're doing again if you've got things you would like me to feature on here just feel free to send them to me as a, an attachment with a little blurb uh, to my email which is in the show notes and I will do that so thanks for watching have a great week go out and make something to put you in your happy place we'll see you later bye bye for now <laughs>